this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the Lian Lee 011 Dynamic Mini Snow Edition. This is an unboxing and an installation video where I'm going to be showing you how to install in this case and what I did to create the final product, which you can see here with Noctua's fans and an air cooler and a number of other things. Now, this is an interesting case for a number of different reasons. Obviously, it's a small case, as you'd have gathered from the name Mini but yet it supports a variety of motherboard sizes all the way up to EATX and I'm using an ATX motherboard in here but there are some other curiosities for example you'll note that you require a small form factor power supply unit at the rear because there's limited space there and yet it's able to hold two hard disk drives and two SSDs or four SSDs on the rear. You can also install radiators for all-in-one coolers. And in this video, I'm gonna be talking to you about those various different highlights. It's interesting because depending on what motherboard setup you're putting in there, you'll have a variety of different setup options. For example, if you use an ITX motherboard, so a really tiny motherboard, you can have a 360 mil radiator on the top or a 360 mil radiator on the bottom and a 280 mil radiator on the side as well, potentially. You obviously have liquid cooling options, but in this video, I'm obviously going to be showing you how to install a setup with just air cooling. And the reason for this is because I purchased this case in the lead up to also buying the Lian Lee at 011 Dynamic Mini Air. So the air edition of this case, I want to be able to do a different video on each and compare them as well so come back for more in the near future and subscribe if you're not already to see that in action but i think this case is not only beautiful but interesting also coming from the dynamic xl which i've been using for a long time i was curious to see what the setup would be like and this is a reasonably affordable case and yet one that comes with a number of interesting highlights it's obviously very well designed i was struck immediately by the sheer quality of the thing and it's not a surprise because Lee and Lee's products are very good you have some very nice panels on there good solid panels really nice thumb screws obviously the dust filters to keep the case nice and clean and make sure that even on the side dust isn't being intaked into the case and making a mess of it you have a removable sort of panel at the rear that can be used not only to hide your cable shame but also for the SSD mounting. So if you have 2.5 inch SSDs, they can be mounted on this plate here. So you can take them off. You can mount them on the front of it or the back so you can hide them away or you can have them on show. You then get access once you take that off to the front panel connectors. And I'll talk about how to install those and where those go a bit later on if you're not too sure. But you can see from the back here, fairly simple cable management. And what you will have seen at the beginning of this video is actually it doesn't get too messy back there, depending on what you're installing. Obviously, I'm not using RGB fans in this build, so that saves on cables and means it's a bit less hectic. But there's still plenty of room back there, even for such a small case. And everything just comes off simply. Most of the panels are held on with thumb screws. The rear is and the top is. Once you take those off, you can then remove the tempered glass side panel and front panel to again get better access all around you'll also note on the top you have two usb a ports a usb c and a mixed audio jack as well as the power button and another dust filter up the top here now as i said if you use an itx motherboard you can mount a 360 mil radiator at the top but because i'm using a ATX motherboard I won't be able to do that and that's why I'll be mounting fans it's worth checking out the page the official page to find out more about this because the modularity obviously changes what it supports so what motherboard you're putting in changes how it works but you can see that you can remove the entirety of the back plate and this is part of the design there's an included box full of extras which allow you to reposition what's going on back here depending on what you're installing and accounting for that as well so obviously you could go for liquid cooling a full liquid cooling setup in here you could squeeze that in you've probably seen some nice shots of other people building in that sort of thing i want to do things differently with an air build rather than liquid cooling so in this video i'm going to show you some of that at the bottom obviously removable dust tray again a nice additional extra to keep dust out of the case so you'll see all the ingress points for air are nicely filtered 
to prevent that dust ingress as well. So we have the case now mostly deconstructed and you can see the space that you have to work with. And what I've found is interesting highlights of it as I've gone through the build. So I'm going to talk through some of them now. I've also done separate videos on the majority of the parts used in this video. So if you want to find out more, for example, about this Corsair SF750 power supply unit that I'm installing now, I'll link to that video in the description where I talk more about that and the cable management and setup of it. But essentially, this small case takes most things. I already said it will take up 360 mil rads in various places, depending on your motherboard. It will also support a multitude of drives, but you do need a small power supply unit because you can't use a full sized RM1. And that's mostly because of the amount of size back there and also the cables and other things. But the installation process is fairly straightforward and this is a 750 watt power supply unit still still going to do the business for me for what i need in the case you also have an accessories box which has a number of different things in it including the manual which is really detailed and goes into a lot of depth on what's what and what you need to do to swap things out if you're looking to change it into another format or in my case to add things in to add extra room for the ATX motherboard so it's well worth referring to you also have a list of what all the different screws are for and things like extra parts that you can purchase because you can get a vertical mount for your GPU for example you'll find bits in there as well that includes all the screws that you need the standoffs the screws for the power supply that you see me screwing in and other bits you'll also find there are plates for brackets for your liquid cooling system so if you have a pump and reservoir you'll find those standoffs and bits and bobs in there for that as well so I can't obviously cover all the different things that are going on in here but what I'm showing is that there are a lot of accessories and a very straightforward manual that talks you through what they all are and how to use them so a very nice setup there and it's nice to see all these extras included and just the flexibility of even such a small case now as I said because I'm installing an ATX motherboard I do need that larger bracket. Interestingly, throughout the case, they're numbered. So you can see there's a variety of holes here and they're all numbered. You might just be able to make out there's a number seven here where I'm pointing. And that is where you need to put the extra standoffs for the an ATX setup. And you'll find these referenced in the manual itself and you'll see all the references there on how you do it, what screws you need to screw it down, the standoffs. And you can see some of the diagrams here on that. So you'll need to change the position of these depending on which one you're using. If you use an ITX, you'll need to reposition the standoffs and they're all nicely numbered up. So it's really dead simple to do. For my purposes, it's a really straightforward setup because all I need to do basically is to take this bracket out of its packeting and then pop it inside the case. It has some metal edging on it that slips into the back and then you're just basically screwing that down. What that does is it gives you extra standoffs that aren't present as standard. So obviously gives full support to the ATX motherboard and makes sure that it's held in place properly. So you'll find the screws are in one of the bag and you can use that to just pop that and screw it down and make sure it's held in place as it needs to be. So it's basically just attaching that bracket to the case and then you can put your motherboard into that and then obviously screw that down to the case itself and to this extra bracket. What you'll see also is a lot of room at the top and the bottom and around the sides. So even though we put this extra bracket in, we still have plenty of room to access the fans and to be able to manage the cables. There are some complexities to this process though, which I'll go into in a bit more depth in a little while. For example, the installation of the fans. My tip now is to get the motherboard in as soon as possible. You'll see why a bit later on, but I made the mistake of leaving the motherboard till nearly the last point in here. And because it's an ATX motherboard, you can see it just takes up quite a bit of room in the case. There are still points of access at the top and bottom where there's holes putting in the cables, but it does become tricky. So now if you're looking to install hard disk drives or SSD drives, then you have a couple of options. As I said, you had that plate that you can remove, but you can also get access to these trays. So there's a couple of points here that you can unscrew. And then there's a small screw at the bottom that you move across and that releases the latch that then lets these trays out. In these trays, you can either install two flatter hard drives, 3.5 inch hard drives, and you can mount them with these various screw holes, or you could put two 2.5 inch SSDs or a mixture of the two. So you have the choice depending on what you want to do. And if you're adding these sorts of things in, I'm just using this for demonstration purposes, 
but it's nice that you have the potential even in a small case to have two large hard drives two ssds or four ssds depending on your setup and what you want to do with it as well as obviously nvme storage on the motherboard as well so there's loads of different options here and it's a straightforward caging system and you'll find reference to what screws you need in the manual that I showed earlier on. So basically just making sure, screw down four screws into this tray to hold it into place. Now you can mount the SSDs in here as well, alternatively, and the process is basically the same. You're just using screws to hold it in place and make sure it's steady in there and then slipping it back into the cage. But quickly to demonstrate all the cables you need to plug in, in case you don't know, you'll find with your motherboard, you should have a SATA connection cable this will plug into the hard drive and then into your motherboard and I'll show you where later on and then you'll need a SATA power cable as well which will plug into the power supply unit on one end and into the hard drive or SSD on the other. I'm just demonstrating this now while it's out of the cage so you can see where it plugs in for ease of use but in a minute I'll show you how to do it when it's actually installed as well. These are impossible to get in the wrong way around which is a bonus so it's really straightforward now the cage just slips back into the hole and don't forget to use, tighten that little screw at the bottom basically when you loosen that it slides back and forth and puts a plate in the way so that the drives can't come out so they won't move around really straightforward in setup so you'll see there's basically lots of different accents to this case that make life easier and logical and then from here, once it's in, it's much easier to install the cables now, although you theoretically could have feed them through the cage if you wanted to plug them in before you put it in. But I'm just demonstrating how to do it in both ways. Now the SATA power cable connection, you'll see this has multiple connection points on it. Plug one end into the power supply unit. And I covered off where to do that in the power supply video if you're curious and you don't know. But you can see it plugs into the peripheral and SATA port in the top there. And then you have daisy chain SATA connection. So you might find, for example, if you're not running the same setup as me, that you might need this power for other things, SSDs, hard disk drives, fan control boxes, for example. If you're using RGB fans or a control hub, you might need extra power that will plug into that. And you can use those in daisy chain effect. Next is the 24 pin power supply cable for your motherboard. This has two cables at one end that plug into the power supply and then the large 24 pin connector, which will plug into the motherboard. I'll do this now early on so that you don't have messing about to do later on, trying to fiddle around when you've got more bits installed. This makes life a lot easier. And the same logic applies to the two eight pin CPU power headers that will plug into the top of the motherboard and to the power supply as well. So we run those to the back. This just makes it a lot easier for later on and you can see some of the space that you have here what you will find in a minute as i'm going to show you is it is limited once you've put the fans in which is why i said actually getting the motherboard in as soon as possible so don't necessarily follow how i'm doing it unless you're using a smaller motherboard and you might find it a lot easier but with an atx motherboard you end up with a very limited amount of space between the top of these cable ports and where the fans are so I found, as I show you, that it became a bit problematic. So it's worth knowing these things. And that's part of the fun of building and then sharing the knowledge from the build that I've done so you can learn from my mistakes and not make the same ones. Obviously, also, we'll need a power supply cable for the graphics card. So we're going to plug that in now. That's Type 4 PCIe, and that plugs in. And then we have to tidy up the back of the cables. Core says power supply unit comes with a number of Velcro ties you can use. It also comes with plastic ties, but at this point, I like to use the Velcro ties just to neaten things up rather than permanently mounting them down with plastic table ties, which could be a bit difficult to remove in future if I've plugged something in wrong or I need to move some cables around for whatever reason. So using these as a temporary solution is a good way. And you'll note the case itself also has multiple points on it for cable tidying. I actually found, as I said earlier, that there's a lot of space here and it's fairly straightforward. Now, for this build, I'm using Noctua's fans. These are renowned for being high quality, offering excellent cooling performance and also being the bee's knees. The installation for the fans is interesting because you have the potential of mounting three 120 mil fans at the top, two on the side that you're seeing here or at the back, and then three at the bottom. Optionally, you can also opt for 140 mil fans instead. 
So there are a variety of configurations that you can do there. For example, in this mode with ATX motherboard, you can put two 140 mil fans at the top, two on that rear panel, and two on the bottom as well. So there's plenty of flexibility in how you do it. But for this case, I am using 120 mil. And I found it was curious when I started mounting these in here as well, because when they're mounted on that back bracket, it looks like you should be able to fit three on there, but you can only fit two. This is partly down to the variety of different radiator support the options that you have. For example, you can mount a 280 mil radiator on that back plate, as I said. So what I'm doing is I am mounting the fans, pulling air in through the bottom and exhausting out through the top and rear. I'm setting them where they're facing down to the bottom of the case, which means they're pulling air up through them and then pushing cold air into the case and hopefully over the components and then eventually running hot and going out the top. You have a variety of ways to install the Noctua fans because they come with rubber bungs that you can use in place of screws to reduce vibrations and noise, which is a nice option. And there's only a single cable from each, but you do have some adapters that I'll show you in a minute. I'm going to do a separate video on the installation of these, but I'm going to talk you through the process now in case you choose to use them. You may opt for some RGB fans or something different. I want to use Noctua fans for cooling purposes, especially for the air build that I'll be doing in the Air Mini at another point in time. So you can see that when you install two 120mm fans on this back plate, you actually have some large gaps at the top and the bottom, which isn't ideal in my mind, but it depends on how you're setting it up. If you had a radiator there, it might not look as bad. I don't think it looks terrible. When you see the final product, it doesn't look as bad because obviously with the back of the case on and everything else set up, you don't really notice that gap as much, I don't think. And obviously you could also reposition them to your personal preference as well. It gives some flexibility, but the fact that you can have 140 mil fans there instead, those might fill it up a bit more and offer up a better look and feel. Again, what I'm doing here is I'm pulling cold air in from the back. So I'm pulling in cold air in from the bottom and from the rear. And then I'm setting it up at the top to exhaust through the top of the case. So I am setting these fans, making sure to be careful that the cables from the fans run into the back. Now, it's one thing I've noticed that these Noctua fans don't come with any sort of fan controller. They have a single cable each that needs to be connected to the motherboard. So you need to make sure you have enough motherboard fan headers to deal with all of these. The fans do, however, come with a variety of extra cables. You'll see there's a low noise adapter, for example, that knocks it down from 2000 RPM to 1500 RPM max, which keeps things a bit quieter. There's a Y cable, which is a splitter cable, which puts two fans into a single connection. And then there's an extension cable. I actually ended up using the extension and Y splitter cables because I was basically putting two cables together and using the extension cable to run the cables to the back of the case and then back through to the front to plug in where I wanted them to. This reduced some of the mess with the cables and I'd recommend doing similar because you'll probably find that you'll end up with a lot of cables in here that need to be plugged into a lot of points on the motherboard. And I'll show you where a bit later on. Now for this build, I'm using a ROG Strix Z690E gaming Wi-Fi, Corsair's Vengeance DDR5 RAM, a WD Black SN850 and a Crucial P5 Plus. So I've got some good speed in a multiple different ways. They should give me very fast RAM, 5,200 megahertz alongside Intel's Core i9-12900K. I've done a video separately on the motherboard talking about the various settings, the software, the highlights of it that includes five NVMe MM2 slots and obviously PCIe Gen 5 for both the graphics card and for the future proofing of things like your NVMe drives as well. And also it runs four slots of DDR5 RAM, so you can potentially fill it up with some wonderful, glorious, super fast RAM at some point as well. I'm using 32 gigs for now, but who knows what the future holds. You'll also note that this motherboard has holes in it for the CPU cooler, which means that you can potentially use older coolers in it as well. So it's a really interesting motherboard for a number of different reasons. And this CPU is also a fantastic bit of kit with 
a mixture of performance and efficiency cores that ensure that it runs both fast and efficiently. Obviously, DDR5 RAM is renowned for being fantastic and very difficult to get hold of, so I'm very lucky that Corsair was kind enough to send over some for me to use in this build and to do content on testing on. And I'm going to be showing off some of that a bit later on as well. Installation for this is fairly straightforward, but it's worth checking your motherboard. If you're not using the same motherboard, they might mount in different positions. If you're not filling all four slots, you need to make sure you put the RAM in the right slots. In this case, it's A2 and B2, according to the motherboard, which seemed unusual to me. You think it'd be A1 and B1, but not the slots right next to each other. There's a gap between them, which leaves a little bit of a gap. The bonus of this Vengeance RAM is it isn't terribly high profile. There's no RGB lighting, but it does mean that it sits fairly low, which is ideal if you're mounting a air cooler like I am. This motherboard, as I said, also has slots for NVMe SSDs. These are both Gen 4 drives, the WD Black SN 850 and the Crucial P5. One I'll be using for my Windows installation and the other one for games. I will also be installing others in the future for things like video editing and other files. This means that I can maximize the glorious speeds of up to 7,000 megabytes per second on these drives and obviously potentially upgrade in future. This is the Noctua NHD15S. This is designed to give optimal air cooling performance. And it's interesting because you mount it in two different ways, which is exactly what I had to do for this build because of the shape of the motherboard, the VRM headers on the motherboard mean that you can't actually mount this in the correct way. I've done a separate video on this and also the performance of this air cooler under pressure and benchmarking and other things that I'll link to in the description is worth checking out. But this isn't actually the optimal way to mount it because of the motherboard, because of this way it's set up. Really what you'd want to do is mount it in a certain direction, which would mean that the air that's being pulled in from the front of the case through those side fans is then pulled over the rad and then out the back. In this case, I'm having to position it so that the air from the bottom is being pulled up and then pushed out the top. It's not the ideal position, but it does still work and it looks magnificent. And the thing that's interesting about it for me is that it's so huge and yet it fits in that tiny case. You will have seen from the shots at the beginning and as I go through this process of installing it, that it is massive. It sits really high off the motherboard and yet it fits in this tiny mini a case from Lee and Lee in a nice way. There's also a configuration tool from Noctua that you can use to check whether your motherboard, RAM and case will support the cooler that you want to buy. So that's well worth looking at. And again, I referenced all of this in the installation video that I did separately on this. So please check out the link in the description if you're curious and want to find out more about it. Now, this is the bit where I came unstuck and here you'll see why the motherboard will fit in here with the fans in but it is a real faff to get it in it, i found that i had to put it in bottom first and then i could just about get it in and put it into position obviously taking care not to scrape the back on any of the standoffs and setting it down in the right place however once I did this, I immediately realized that I had a problem. So don't do the same thing as me. Make sure you install the fans last because you'll see that I can now not access the power for the top of the motherboard. Both the two 8-pin power supply cables will not be installable in this setup. And also I can't access the CPU fan header to attach the cooler to the motherboard so to get cooling for the CPU, which is obviously a big problem. And so I had to go about the process of removing and moving those top fans out of the way so that I can then access those cables, put them into place, and then put the fans back in. So you don't need to necessarily set it all up without any of the fans in place. But I'd certainly recommend not doing what I did and installing the top fans and then trying to install the motherboard or do it the other way around. But it's an interesting highlight of this because I've done this sort of thing with other cases and not had a problem but here this setup was different. So once that's all done, then I can put the CPU fan header, which comes out of the cooler into the CPU fan connection. Here you'll also know on this motherboard, there's an optional extra CPU fan header as well. So you could, if you had the space, which unfortunately I don't, have two fans on the radiator, which would make it even cooler. 
Then obviously screwing the motherboard down. There are screws in the case for this. And you need to make sure it's about nine, I believe, screws that hold that motherboard down into the standoffs that we set up earlier. Remember the back plate that we put in, those standoffs will ensure that the entirety of the motherboard is held securely in place. And obviously that it doesn't slip or slide around once it's set down. You can see I also have some of the cabling for the fans set up and ready to go. You'll note just how long it is with those extra extender leads. Now we have the two 8-pin CPU power connectors from the power supply unit that need to be plugged into the motherboard. You plug those in at the top. And now I have a lot more room without the fans there. But you get an idea since I'm putting my hand through the fan tray just how limited the space is. The good news is that once they're in and then when you put the fans back in, there's no problem with the cables touching the fans, it's just the insulation of it which is a bit of an issue. But I found there was enough room for it once I'd done this and actually set it up properly with the cables installed, I could get the fans back in no problems. On the right hand side, the 24 pin cable for the motherboard that I previously set up is now ready to be plugged in and it's obviously one of the most important cables to plug in. And then I want to talk to you about the front panel connectors. So I showed these a little bit earlier on, but we basically have this large USB connector for the front panel USB. That's the USB-C connector. And I'll show you where that goes in a second. Then you have the front power connections and the HD audio. So all of these will be run through to the motherboard and plugged in in a variety of places. I recommend checking out your motherboard manual to find out where these are. But the USB-C one, for example, looks like this. Plugs in near the 24-pin power supply unit cable. Make sure you plug that in. And the USB-A will also plug in next to that. That is the big fat one that you can see here. You can set that in and plug that in there. Those are usually in the same place around the 24-pin power supply cable. So it's fairly straightforward into where they are. Things get a little bit more fiddly with the front panel power connections. And you can see the SATA cable for the hard disk drive comes through and plugs in here. It's worth noting that some motherboards, if you're using M2 drives, disable some of the SATA ports. So if you find that your hard drives or SSDs aren't working, it's worth checking the manual to find out which ones are disabled because I've had that happen quite a few times in the past. Front panel connections for the power connect down the bottom there and HD audio on the left hand side. So one is on the right and the other is on the left. Now at the back, you can see what I was talking about with the extension lead. So I've run the wire splitters from the various cables. So most of the fans in the case are now taken from two fan cables into one single one, and I'm then running an extension lead. And this is because the fan headers on the motherboard are limited. There are a limited number of them, which makes plugging them in tricky. It's also worth assessing where you're going to plug them in because you'll find that the positioning of them is also difficult. I had a bit of a struggle with mine, as you'll see. And things can get quite messy because you've got quite a lot of cables. But there's only one single cable from each fan. Once you put it into the Y splitter, you then obviously have a lot of extra mess potentially with these adapters and other things. And hiding that at the front is particularly difficult, I think. So this is part of the reason why I ran them all to the back and put the extension leads on. You probably don't need to use the extension lead. And if you're not using as many fans as me, you probably won't even need to use the Y splitters. But because I'm using quite a few fans here, it definitely made it necessary. And it makes it a lot easier when you can then run it back through and find the best points for the system fan headers. Now I already showed you where to mount the CPU fan header. And that goes at the top of the motherboard, but you'll find in various different positions that there are system fan headers on the motherboard. So, for example, the bottom right and middle left of this motherboard, you can see two, for example, underneath the SATA connections here. And there are two that sit on the other side nearby this. And then you'll find one at the bottom. So there's a variety of different positions and it can be a bit of a fiddle to work out where they are and plug them in. You can see one of the cables here is not ideally sort of hidden away and it's plugged in underneath the CPU cooler. But I thought that wasn't really going to be a problem because now I'm going to go about the process of installing the graphics card. So in order to do that, you're basically just removing those back plates, take them off. So we've got access to the 
PCIe X16 slot. It's always preferable to use the top slot because that one usually gets the fastest speeds. And in this motherboard, it's Gen 5, so it's future proof. So we're then just plugging the graphics card in here. I have a 3060 Ti Founders Edition card, which I'm using for this build. And that just slips into place nicely. Another highlight of this motherboard is it has a quick release button for the PCIe slot as well. So you can just press that and pop the graphics card back out if you need to. We use the screws that were on those plates to then hold it in place. And then we have a PCIe cable that we plugged in earlier to the power supply unit. And that runs into here and plugs in. Obviously, if you need to, you could run two cables through from the rear because some graphics cards require more. So now we have the finished product, and I'm pretty happy with it, I'll be honest. Obviously, it doesn't have the in-your-face RGB that you'll see in most other builds and my own previous videos on other cases where I put RGB fans in. And it might look nicer with RGB fans, but actually these Noctua fans are fantastic for cooling, and it's an unusual look and feel to it and one that stands out as being quite different. I am going to be reusing most of this setup in the future in the Air Mini once that's arrived because I'm still waiting on it as it's been delayed like all things in the last couple of years. But here you are. Let me know what you think in the comments and please, if you've got any questions, please let me know. and I'll try and help out if I can. But this is a fantastic case with loads of different options for installation plenty of room for different setups in terms of radiators and fans and all sorts of sizes and it gives you loads of different options and for such a small case it's really capable just look at the size of that cooler for example this has been the provoke prawn thanks for watching this has been the provoke prawn hope you found this video useful interesting hilarious or otherwise take a look at these other videos that i think you might find interesting as well and have a look at the description for links and other information you might find useful click that join button to see the benefits of being a member of my youtube channel and most importantly have a great life